February 1st, 2021, Napido, Myanmar. Aerobics instructor Kinin Wai had just begun her morning routine of taking dance videos of herself in the country's capital. Moving to the music's rhythm in front of the country's parliament house, she was completely oblivious to a military convoy rumbling in behind her. Unannounced, they took control of the Luto or Parliament House on the very morning the newly elected government was supposed to meet for its opening session. Sidelining Aung San Suu Kyi, leader of the NLDP party, who in November 2020 won a thumping re-election as the country's leader. Myanmar had just been taken over in a military coup and Suu Kyi, for the umpteenth time, denied by the generals. The usurpers did a textbook takeover clamping down meticulously by ticking all the right boxes, but was still unable to stop the outpouring of red outfits from spilling out into the streets. Waving three-finger salutes, used as a symbol of protest against autocratic societies, inspired by the Hunger Games movies and also used by Thailand in 2014. Night after night, they bang steel utensils in defiance, a practice first begun in 19th century France, complaining against poor economic conditions. Protesting against the military is not new to Myanmar, who have had a history of coups, 1962, 88 and now once again, ruling the country for 41 of the last 59 years. In 1989, they changed the nation's name from Burma to Myanmar, a name already interchangeably used within the country, to rid it from the colonial baggage it was associated with and because it did not represent all the 135 ethnic groups except for the Burmese. But something happened a year earlier that changed the future course of this newly named country. Aung San Suu Kyi, a housewife living in the UK, returned to her native country in April 1988 to take care of her ailing mother, or so it is said. However, Suu Kyi's homecoming couldn't have been better timed. Suu Kyi was the daughter of General Aung San, who helped Burma attain independence from British rule in 1948, but who was unfortunately assassinated the same year. Just days before she returned, University students had risen up in protest against the military in what came to be known as the 8888 uprising because it gained momentum on 8th August 1988. A pressured Ni Win, who was ruling the country since the 1962 coup, resigned. Sensing a void or maybe waiting for the right moment, she gave her first speech a month later to a massive audience in Rangoon. This uprising is our second struggle for independence. The brutal killing of almost 3,000 protesters a few weeks later probably gave momentum to what happened next. Placing Suu Kyi under house arrest and in the mistaken belief that they had contained her threat, the military called for elections the following year, allowing her to contest against a propped-up military candidate. Result? Suu Kyi won hands down over 60% of the votes and 80% of parliamentary seats. But instead of sitting in parliament, she remained under house arrest for the next 15 years till 2010, refusing to leave the country and be reunited with her husband and two kids who remained behind in the UK. You are free to go to London to meet your family. If I leave now, you will never allow me to come back. Her heroic stand earned her the Nobel Peace Prize in 1991, which was accepted by her two sons while she remained under house arrest. But the world did not forget Suchi thereafter as they imposed sanctions on Myanmar's dictators, forcing it more and more into China's fold. Her people didn't forget her either. In 2007, 2,000 Buddhist monks gathered outside Suu Kyi's home and prayed with her, leading to yet another uprising and yet another brutal crackdown. However, knowing they could not hold on forever, in preparation of multi-party elections, Myanmar's military passed their new constitution, aka Tatmadaw, a year later permanently entitling them to 25% of the 664 seats in both the Houses of Parliament, reserving the right to veto any decision made by the elected legislature, forever taking control of three powerful ministries, defence, home and border affairs, so as to wield control over any future civilian government. Finally, after they felt secure that the military would continue their dominance, they released Suu Kyi in November 2010. Sidelining her from the 2010 elections, but allowing her to contest in 2015, where she expectedly won a huge majority again. Because her children are foreign nationals, the military's new constitution barred her from being president, so she took power as state councillor. Resigned to the reality of being a secondary player to the military, she did not confront the generals head-on during her term. Defending the Burmese military against allegations of genocide against the Rohingya at the International Court of Justice. And when asked, 
Are the Rohingya citizens of your country? I don't know. And ignored calls for the release of journalists Walon and Kyosio from jail, refusing to withdraw petitions against poet Saw Wai and Maun Saungka, the same international community that supported her by sanctioning Myanmar, now questioned her credibility as a human rights figure. So why did the military take over now, when her actions did not pose any threat to them, and in fact her presence allowed the world to accept the veneer of democracy? Did General Ming On Ling want to be prime minister himself? or was he threatened by the sheer size of suchi's parliamentary majority which could eventually undermine their dominance whatever the reason china sees this as an opportunity to reclaim its hold over the country blocking the un security council from issuing a statement condemning the junta china has a lot at stake in myanmar with investments of at least 3.6 billion dollars including developing their 5g network and has also loaned them 4 billion dollars the china myanmar economic corridor part of China's BRI initiative is developing the Kyokfu deep sea port giving them a foothold in India's backyard however to correct its over dependence on china is one reason the generals freed suchi in the first place and went down the path of democracy a policy they still follow today buying indian coronavirus vaccines and submarines and arms from russia instead of from china one reason for being wary of their old friend is china's support to the pro independence arakanami which wages a bloody war against Myanmar's military. China has also used the Arakan army to sabotage India's Kaladan Road project by kidnapping five engineers working there. A multi-nodal project that will collect Kolkata with Sitway by sea while simultaneously linking it by road to Mizoram via the Kaladan river boat route. Then there is the India Myanmar Thailand trilateral highway that will later be extended to Vietnam, projects on which India has already spent 1.7 billion dollars. Add to this the 1.2 billion worth of investments by over 100 Indian private companies operating from offices in Yangon, Myanmar's financial and commercial center, most of whom went there post 2016 after Obama lifted the final round of sanctions, one of his last international acts as president. Ironically, in one of his first international acts as president, Biden reimposed sanctions on Myanmar's military junta. The US will block access to the more than 1 billion dollars that the generals have in our country. Sensing this may jeopardize India's interest, it has expressed concern but hasn't condemned the coup directly. We hope the current law and order situation doesn't affect the development projects in the region. On the other hand, China's mouthpiece Global Times called the coup a cabinet reshuffle. Since the 1990s, India has cultivated the generals and Indian foreign secretaries are often accompanied by army chiefs. thereby showing equal respect to both arms of their government they need the general support against insurgent groups which use myanmar as a safe haven to wage war against india emotionally though india may have a better equation with suchi who as a 16 year old moved with her mother dokinki to india in 1960 and studied in delhi's convent of jesus and mary and lady shri ram college and was a fellow at the indian institute of advanced studies shimla irrespective of these events people to people contact remains unchanged in the northeastern border town of more which surprisingly is home to several tamils who fled myanmar during the military massacre in 1962 but who continue to live there and trade with their adopted homeland the cornered military is finding it more and more difficult to restrain itself but has not cracked down as brutally on civilians as they did in 1962 88 or 2007 going ahead with their partial trial against nld leaders for supposedly importing 10 walkie talkies a crime punishable by a 3 year prison term us's megaphone diplomacy that is shouting threats from afar as they have little to lose in the region and calling myanmar with its old name burma shows complete lack of understanding and may complicate matters for india who may be pressured to toe the us line the generals would not like to turn to china but sanctions may leave them with no choice when kyo mon thun myanmar's ambassador to the un at great personal risk to himself denounce the military takeover the international community should use any means possible to take action against myanmar's military it was yet another twist in this saga that inspired his fellow citizens to continue their struggle for the third time in 60 years base bose limerick it's deja vu for ansan suchi once again she is not free threatened by her win the generals put her in but it's the citizens that will face the brunt of this decree do join bizbone discord
and follow us on Instagram at GoBizBo. Subscribe to Bizbo and click on the bell icon to get notified whenever Bizbo releases a new video. Sources of all our information is listed in the video description section.